Hey guys, today I'm going to be talking to you about the software that I use for astrophotography. So let's check it out. My name's John Robinson, the AstroTark. This is Deep Sky. Okay, welcome to the laptop. So I'm gonna show you some of the software drivers that I use, applications, and why I use them. So let me show you some B-roll first. Uh, I have a laptop in the kitchen where I have a very fast Core i7 processor running and 1.5 terabyte hard drives connected with a very long USB 3.0 cable to a USB 3.0 hub, powered hub, sitting on the leg of the, pro of the, the mount tripod outside. Plugged into that uh, powered hub is the camera, the moonlight autofocuser, and the mount connection itself through the SynScan hand controller. Now the software that I use on the laptop is basically here. I've sort of organized it this way for you so you can see it. Essential software, experimental, utilities, and production. So under essential, this is what I would consider fundamental. You gotta have this in order to take astrophotos. The first thing you need to do anything here is ASCOM platform. This is the platform that's going to allow all the different hardware pieces, your mount, your camera, um, you know, your, uh, all your equipment basically to communicate to each other through a common platform. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty handy thing and you gotta start with that. So s s install this first. But some of the other things I have in here, I have some apps from Moonlight Autofocuser. These are the drivers for the Moonlight. Uh, I have some scripts, third-party scripts that I use as plugins, uh, handy scripts in post-processing. I'll show you those in a minute. AutoStackard is a, a program that I seldom use, but nevertheless is useful if I need to do planetary image stacking. Since PixInsight doesn't do very well with planetary, I use AutoStackard for that. Deep Sky Stacker was a tool that I used in the early days to do this, the image integration. I don't use it much anymore. I think PixInsight does a better job anyway. Not sure why, but at some point I thought that .NET 35 setup was important and essential, so it's in here. Uh, another driver for ASCOM, GIMP. This is a third-party program that I use in place of Photoshop. I, I'm all about low cost, so Photoshop is way too expensive and I don't like the subscription model that they have at Adobe, so uh, GIMP is free and it works for me, as well as that plug-in for astronomy. Uh, again, more Moonlight uh, ASCOM drivers. PHD2, this is the guiding software. And then, of course, PixInsight. This is the post-processing behemoth, which is over $300. That uh, takes a lot to figure it out, but absolutely is a powerful tool. And the activation uh, codes that I use after purchasing the software. Sequence Generator Pro, absolutely essential in planning out and sequencing your uh, image session. Runs all night and controls your mount. And does plate solving, finds uh, targets in the sky to take pictures of. SharpCap, an alternative to Sequence Generator Pro, which I'm starting to play with. Essentially, the idea with SharpCap is rather than, unlike Sequence Generator Pro, which captures a sub every two minutes or every three minutes, SharpCap doesn't save any files. It saves everything in memory. And essentially, what it's trying to do is, as you take a new picture, it will resolve in memory the average pixel value. So you can sort of see the image coming to life before your very eyes, which is a kind of a cool concept. Um, but it depends on, you know, having perfect guiding and, um, you know, running the risk of if an airplane gets in your image, it's going to screw it up. But nevertheless, it's a sort of fun tool that I play with once in a while. License file for that. Another Skywatcher ASCOM driver. Stellarium. This is a key software that I use for uh, polar alignment as well as choosing which, which targets I want to work on during the evening. Here's another driver for the uh, SynScan. And then some files from ZWO. 
This is the driver for ASCOM, and this is a standalone application that allows you to play with the, the camera itself. So those are the essentials. Under experimental, I've got uh, Astro Pixel Processor. I'm not even sure what it does. I haven't played with it. Astro Tortilla, Nebulosity, some uh, PIPP. This is another planetary image stacking program that I haven't mastered yet. It seems complicated. I haven't gotten into it. Um, Nebulosity, Registax. Again, experimental, meaning some point I'll get around to playing with these things. I guess maybe the next one that I really want to get into would be this Astro Pixel processor or the Nebulosity. I've heard other folks, you know, use that software and I kind of want to get into it and see what it's all about. Some utilities, WinZip, there's a font, an antivirus, Team Viewer, and video production, some watermark stuff, some MPEG stuff, um, um, K Lite Codex. This is what I, this is the software that I'm using to actually record this desktop, the OBS. Um, Vegas is the choice that I use for uh, mixing the video. So that's it. Those are the files that I have all sort of saved. Uh, and uh, maybe this is a good reference for you as you figure out what software you need. Now let's go ahead and look at a couple of them. Let's start with Stellarium. So this is the first software package that I would launch for the evening. This is sitting on the laptop. And uh, Stellarium is going to allow me to do the polar alignment since I can use this to control my mount and tell it to point 90 degrees orthogonal. Since I can't see Polaris, I use the alternative drift align tool in PHD2. I have another video on that. Anyway, Stellarium sort of points my telescope in the right direction to do the drift align. The other thing that it does is allows me to choose an image target for the session. Now, typically I like to look at things from the perspective of starting in the east, rotating over to the west. So I'd probably typically look at something in the eastern skies, uh, like this M3 over here, or maybe M53. Click on that. I can see that that's a cluster. See what size it would appear in my image. Uh, and the, the image size would be like that. And uh, I could sort of fast forward in time and see where this thing's going to appear throughout the night. So I do that by just sort of moving time this way. I can see it's arcing across the sky and gets close to the meridian at a certain time. And I can pause it there and kind of see where a meridian flip would probably be necessary. Again, this is about 7 a.m. in the morning and the sun's coming up, so it'd probably be long done by then. But anyway, you can see that it's. I'm looking for objects that start in the southeast and sort of set into the southwest. Uh, because I have a good visibility of this area of the sky and I have zero visibility of this area of the sky. So that's Stellarium. The other one is PHD2. Now this is the guiding software. Uh, the way you connect to that is uh, after you've installed the ASCOM drivers you would see your camera here. I choose the very bottom one, ZWO ASI. I would typically click here to, to indicate that I want to use the guide camera. And then here's the uh, Skywatcher ASCOM driver there. Then go ahead and uh, if it were connected I would start the software and let it rip. Sequence Generator Pro. Now I've already launched this in the background but allow, this essentially allows me to um, plan the imaging session. So here what we have is uh, I'm looking at for example the MC66 Leo triplet. The first thing you'll look at is under this triplet picture here this red box is representing uh, where I'm plate solved. Plate solved means uh, finding an object in the sky using this picture as a reference. So this picture is telling my telescope that I want you to slew to this area of the sky until these three objects are more or less in this field of view like this. And when I'm when I'm slewed on the target I can expect that this is the picture that I'm going to be taking throughout the night. Uh, that that's what that's going to be doing using plate solving. Uh, so the M66 LEO triplet looks like I'm capturing uh, LOOM and H3 because both of those are enabled. I'm capturing two minute exposures. Uh, I have 50 here and only one here, which seems odd. That should probably be 50 as well. You can see that I have captured 16 out of 50 frames here and zero out of 50 frames for, for hydrogen. Um, this is the location where I'm saving everything. I don't know why I'm doing it in Rosette. It seems like an odd place to be storing M66 files, but nevertheless. And here's the file naming convention. 
uh, it would be the name of the target, uh, the exposure time, the bin, the filter that I'm using, the bias and gain settings that I'm using, the focus position, and the temperature, and finally a sequence number. It's a very long file name, but it helps me to sort of figure out, you know, uh, what it is and where it is and when it is. So I like to have it that way. Uh, I can choose to, you know, rotate, uh, allow this uh, event one to finish before it begins event two, or I can rotate event one and two, one and two. I typically don't like to do that because probably I would want to do an autofocus in between each one. I like to limit my autofocusing to only at every 45 minute intervals, so I'd probably use this segment setting here. Uh, yeah, so this is the the sort of the sequencing dialog, and here's all the equipment where you would be connecting your camera your fil filter wheel, your focuser, and your and your mount itself. And to connect, you'd simply click on these little gray buttons here and make them all gold color, and you know you're connected. The other cool, uh, or I guess a, a panel that you need to be familiar with is this control panel here. In the control panel, you know, this is where you're, you're gonna monitor your temperature of your camera, or you can even set the temperature. You can set the gain setting for all of these imaging sessions. Um, you can see which filter is currently being used or you can say go to a specific filter to override the sequence settings I guess. You can set your autofocus settings in here. I use this a lot so I'm using every 45 minutes I do an autofocus or every three and a half degree temperature change or every time I do a sequence start or every time I do a, uh, a centering action which would be the result of a plate solve for example. When I do that, I'm going to capture for the loom filter, five second exposures for hydrogen. For the rest of the filters, seven second exposures. And this is the stepper motor position for the focus, uh, focusing point start uh, for that particular filter. Uh, so it, it zooms in and it sets the stepper motor and it will perform the focus. Um, it, does, it, it measures seven data points. It steps between 25 uh, stepper motor positions and then it determines the sort of the V pattern and the bottom, bottom of the V will be determined the new focus position and it will set that focus position for that filter. So that's kind of a, a cool little uh, essential really you need to set that up. This is where you do your mount settings. This is be responsible for example the meridian flip if I were asleep during the when it reached the meridian so that it wouldn't bang itself into the legs of my telescope. And then the plate solving. This is I'm using, you could, there's lots of ways to do it. I use the plate solve too. You could also use astronomy.net. Plate solve too seems a bit more intuitive. I do max regions for sec second exposure, one by one binning. I do this uh, for a maximum of up to 25 times so that it can center itself to within 35 pixels of 35 pixels of this red box here. And yeah, that's the control panel. So I should mention that all this is under the control of the, the narrow band only and the profile. So I'm using the equipment profile called narrow band only. This is where you set all your default settings like your file naming pattern, your cool down temperature, your gain settings. Similarly, there are default values for the filters, for the focus, for the telescope, for the plate solving, and the auto guiding. Now these profile settings can be overridden in the control panel, and the control panel settings can be overridden in the event itself. So for example, in the equipment profile, you can see that I have a default camera gain of 139. I can override the default gain for the equipment profile in the control panel by just setting this to 75. And by doing so, this would apply a gain setting of 75 to all of these sequences in this, in this panel here. But let's say within, I wanted 75 gain for all the sequences except for the Leo triplet. For the Leo triplet, I want to use a gain setting of zero. So essentially this, this setting here overrides the control panel setting. The control panel setting overrides the profile manager setting. Anyway, useful tip. So anyway, that's uh, Sequence Generator Pro. And uh, yeah, 
I'm going through this really quickly. I'm sure you may have questions. Just let me know what questions you may have. Uh, let's see, what else we want to talk about? Mm, maybe GIMP. I do get into GIMP a little bit. As I said, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Photoshop because of the expense. Although it is a very capable piece of software, I think GIMP does a fine job. What I really like about GIMP is it has some filters for, um, you know, like this noise reduction here that I really like. And uh, it can also do some color tuning and sharpening. Uh, it just finishes uh, off and does some different algorithms compared to PixInsight. And sometimes it's a nice little way to, to fine tune the images in the end. Okay, so that's the software that I use. I, I hope that, I know it was fast and furious, but if you've watched it this long, then this must have been useful to you. Anyway, thanks for tuning in. Let me know in the comment section if you have any specific questions about the settings that I use or any of the software that I use. In the meantime, clear skies.